Hello, and welcome back to SSON's AP Automation Digital Summit. Naomi Secor here with the Shared Services and Outsourcing Network. And I am so excited for this next session, which is all about accounts payable transformation, a real world perspective sponsored by our great partners at Infosys. So just before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. We have great speakers with us live. We would love to take your questions. Please refer to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your console and put your questions in as they come along. Also, Infosys BPM has provided a great asset on accounts payable in the cloud. So I do encourage you to pick that up before you leave today. I've also placed our speakers' contact information and links to their uh, profiles on the console so that you can continue the networking after this session. So with that, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers. We have Arne Prasad Bikait, who's the ADP and Head of Digital Business Solutions at Infosys BPM. He holds global responsibility for the creation of innovative solutions on software plus services humanware model leveraging new technologies such as automation, AI, machine learning, analytics, and domain expertise to reimagine how enterprise business processes are delivered. And you can read more about them also on the console. And we have Sandeep Sahad Devan, who is the head key solutions for finance and accounting at Infosys BPM. And he's responsible for driving finance transformation across customers, leveraging technology, including a portfolio of in-house products, best of breed partner platforms, robotics, and AI solutions. So welcome, thank you for being here. Infosys is a wonderful partner to the SSOM, we're really excited. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Naomi. Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be on the SSON panel. Um, so I'm gonna perhaps start with a very cliched statement, right? AP uh, should be a touchless process. And that's something that a lot of our customers and what is on my scoreboard as well, to move it to a touchless process. But what we ask ourselves often is, is, it, is this really a touchless process, right? Um, the reality is that companies spend an enormous amount of money and effort on the accounts payable process. It still continues to be one of the most outsourced processes out there in the business, in the finance and accounting world, right? Um, so in today's session, uh, we've got 30 minutes. Uh, it's a pretty intense session. We would want to divide this into three sections. Uh, we want to start with what we describe as imperfections in the accounts payable process and what we see. Um, we then would perhaps get into uh, an interesting discussion around uh, what the market is actually doing, uh, both from an industry perspective uh, and also on the exciting side of digital, which Hari is going to talk about, right? Uh, we want to conclude this uh, by talking to you about our experience um, on, a multiple, uh, on multiple areas. One specifically on transformation journeys that we've done for some of our customers. We will talk to you about one case study in specific. Uh, give you some perspectives about uh, how we describe AP.life, our accounts payable framework to move uh, organizations into a sentient organization. And uh, perhaps uh, give you a peek into um, our entire concept of knowledge graph, how we have been using analytics uh, to drive you know, better accounts payable, right? So that's broadly what we want to cover. Uh, we would want to make this interactive, so please keep your questions coming in. There is also an interactive poll, right? So uh, let's start with, uh, you know, the imperfect AP as we call it, right? Um, yeah, I would perhaps want to go back to the 101 of AP, right? Um, a very simplified view of the value stream in accounts payable, right? Um, it typically is a three-step process if you, if, you, if you think of it, right? There is an invoice transmission that happens by the supplier. Uh, invoices are received, posted, and then paid, right? However, when you look at what actually happens in practice, um, it is what we describe as digital deconstruction at its best, right? The great example of digital deconstruction, and I'll tell you why I say that. Um, a totally digital format, uh, let's say your supplier is on SAP, right? a totally digital format, an IDOC format, um, is translated into an intermediate format using HTML or other technologies, right? Um, this is then printed out uh, through into a paper or into a PDF document attached and then you know transmitted either through the post or through an email. Um, at this state, we describe this as a perfectly analog state, right? A, a completely digital document has been translated, transformed into an, a perfectly analog state, right? Here we come in as accounts payable experts, um, you know, trying to get this back into a digital format. We receive it, spend enormous amounts of money and effort 
on on kind of transforming this back into digital format, process it, and then you know this gets paid, right? So what are the problems? And the entire section that we want to discuss is, you know, what are the problems that perhaps stop us from having this, you know, the mythical touchless process, right? Um, I think all of us understand that, you know, having multiple formats, right? I mean, there is no uniform. We wish there was one universal business language that the entire accounts payable world and technology understood and everybody transmitted and talked in that same language. Life would have been easy, right? So in this next section, um, we want to perhaps get into, uh, you know, polling you and getting your perspectives of what you see as a big problem in accounts payable. Yeah, that's great. So we have got a poll here on the screen. We'd like you to rank your biggest challenge in accounts payable. You can see the choices here, effort and cost and invoice, inefficient approval process. Please review the options. We're going to give everybody 15 seconds to take this poll, and then we're going to show you the results real time. Okay, let's go ahead and see what we've got here. This is pretty interesting uh, from, from our perspective as well. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe let me talk through some of this that we often hear about, right? So one of the reasons that we gave you those six options is that, um, you know, as a part of our accounts payable practice, we do about, you know, 2.25 uh, million invoices a year. Um, we do it for about 100 different customers. And as we start these transformation journeys, you know, uh, the initial conversations are around what the key problem statements are, right? Uh, one table stake that we always get is that you need to reduce our costs. So that's table stakes, we're ignoring that. Um, I want to perhaps pick on the ones that you've also selected, uh, you know, in terms of digitization, inefficient data entry, right? Um, if you look at what Accounts Table is all about, 40% of your effort is actually spent in the digitization process, right? Like I described in the previous uh, slide, about trying to re-digitize a digital document. So that's where most efforts have been spent, right? So while we understand this is a big challenge, we also wanted to give you a kind of a, a view in terms of how the pandemic has influenced some of these challenges, right? I mean, has this really uh, been a change in the pandemic? And um, on this digitization and inefficient data entry, we're happy to note that in the last two years, uh, at least customers who have been using, you know, paper and, you know, scanning centers as a primary mode of, of uh, inverse transmission, uh, there has been an improvement. We see a significant adoption of, of uh, electronic invoicing and, and electronic invoicing not necessarily in the formats of EDI and XML, but, you know, native PDFs and the likes of it. So we are seeing that a lot a lot of companies have actually joined the bandwagon of digital, right, in, in whatever sense of digital. But that's a good thing. And we even after the pandemic is kind of getting to a normalization, we see that trend continue. So that's a good thing to see, right? Um, the second big problem, like you've noted, um, you know, the effort intensive approval cycles. Now, there are two fundamental problems with, with, with the approval cycles, right? One, uh, the time and effort it takes to kind of route these invoices to the approvers, right? So you, it, it's a very intense process, a lot of technology out there that does this, but that's one of the problems. The second problem is the entire, you know, the time that it takes to get an invoice approved once it reaches, reaches an approval. So some data facts for you. 50% of invoices get approved in two business days. That's great. 10% of invoices take more than 10 days, right? So if you're looking at a 30-day cycle, you've got 10% of invoices stuck in different stages of approval, right? So it is a very intense problem to solve. Unfortunately, the pandemic has also kind of negatively influenced this. Uh, when we look at our nudge rates, and when I say nudge rates, these are technology pushes that we try to get, uh, you know, get uh, to kind of uh, allow approvers to respond back. We've had a almost doubling of our efforts into getting uh, approvals back to us in time. Uh, so that's been a kind of a detrimental impact on the entire approval cycle. The third big element that we see, uh, discrepancies and exceptions. Um, if you look at the three biggest uh, discrepancies that we see, uh, the first one is uh, definitely on price, right? I mean, price, uh, you know, uh, PO, when I say PO exceptions, anything from, you know, not having the right PO information on it or having, uh, you know, a uh, some kind of a defect in that PO uh, causes the second big problem. And of course, not getting your, uh, you know, service or your material as per the invoice is the third problem. So, um, you know, there are a lot of these that happen in the AP process. And um, the pandemic has actually helped it in a little bit, right? A uh, lot of our stakeholders have asked us to be a lot more stringent in terms of ensuring that 
um, the input that comes in has the re relevant information. So rejection at source has increased, and that actually is translated into better realization. Of course, there are some downstream problems with coming to that. Secondly, uh, we're also seeing a lot of companies adopt uh, analytics in a major way, and, and we've got the knowledge graph, which Hari is going to talk about, right? The ability to start looking at understanding and pinpointing and solving that problem for you, right? I mean, looking at uh, why a variance should occur using AI and ML. So some, some, some of these techniques have also helped the cost, and that's, that explains why there is a betterment of the entire process. Um, the, the third big problem that we see is in terms of disparate AP processes. Uh, I'm sure that all of you will, will, will kind of, uh, this one resonates with a lot of you. Um, three out of four customers that we deal with have more than one instance of, of an ERP or multiple instances of purchasing systems, right? You compound that with you know, nuances that relate to region, geos, business units, and then you have very disparate processes. However, in the last two years, we've seen a sizable improvement or the number of conversations that we're having or number of implementations that we're having, uh, having around um, a single uh, system, a single AP system like APOC, the straddles this diverse heterogeneous uh, landscape has improved tremendously. So we're seeing a lot more adoption of technology to solve this heterogeneous problem. Um, I noted that nobody said supply queries are a problem. And, and to a certain extent, uh, you know, the pandemic has not really influenced that as much as uh, we thought it would. But in terms of technology adoption, we're seeing a lot of companies adopt, you know, chat, chatbot, self-service and the likes of it. And that has actually helped uh, keep the number of queries under check, right? And another area that I'm pretty surprised that we didn't get too many uh, takers is, is the entire concept of fraud, compliance and controls, right? Um, most of our com most of our uh, you know um, uh, customers have asked us um, or ask us about what controls uh, we you know uh, need to be employing in this consumer process. I also wanted to kind of drop some facts, right? The number of phishing attempts that we see on an accounts payable process is significantly you know uh, increased in the last two years, right? Thankfully, um, the number of actual uh, you know, frauds that are committed have reduced in the pandemic. And I would attribute that to a variety of reasons. One, of course, system controls have got a lot, lot smarter and, and sharper in, in terms of how that is controlled. Uh, secondly, I think there's a paradigm shift in how, you know, service providers like us look at controls, right? Um, when the pandemic struck us, we had to kind of decentralize our teams. You know, we had all these teams which sat in one center. And suddenly you had all these teams that had to get fragmented with, you know, working from home. And therefore, we had to kind of completely reimagine a compliance regime and, and think about it very, very differently. So there's a lot of focus around controls. And these, I think, are how we are looking at, you know, the big challenges and how the pandemic has actually influenced that. I want to now move on um, to the next section. And uh, this is about how we see what the market is doing, right? Uh, there are two sections in this. Uh, let me talk about the more boring stuff, while Hari will talk about all the exciting things in technology. Uh, in terms of industry trends, uh, I just wanted to kind of give you some perspectives of what we're seeing. Um, there is a big trend in reducing invoice, uh, the number of invoices, right? We call that invoice less. And um, there are a lot of tactical measures, a lot of suppliers and a lot of our customers are adopting. One, of course, you know, invoice aggregation of getting more number of uh, shipments on one particular document and reducing the number of invoices. That's one tactical approach that they're taking. We're also seeing a big revival in the interest in, in technology such as ERS, right, or self-billing. Um, it is more pronounced in certain industries. Uh, we see it big in automotive, and, and I'm sure that you understand why. I mean, they were the pioneers in the entire ERS journey. We're also seeing a big uptake in retail, um, you know, in industries uh, such as that. And again, um, there's been a big geo influence, right? US, uh, Germany, the UK, these are geos which have adopted, have legality when it comes to ERS. But then of course, uh, there are regions, there are legal challenges in, but we're seeing a big revival in ERS. Um, the next big uh, trend that we're seeing in the, in the office or in, in, in the entire AP space is um, what we call as um, the unified desks. Um, we, for one, have stopped the siloed AP help desks and you know procurement help desks. Whenever we support end-to-end uh, -end process, we've started these uh, you know units that support all supply interaction. Right? This 
um, has not only reduced the number of queries that are coming in, of course, through chat and everything else, but we're also seeing a better supplier experience, not only for suppliers, but even internal units, right? So anything to do with, you know, a purchase hold being resolved or a query being handled is now being channelized into such teams. So uh, unified offices, uh, unified desks, uh, a big trend in the market and accounts payable. The third is, you know, an incidental benefit that accrues to, you know, downstream AP processes. We are seeing um, the procurement, the CPOs and the CFOs uh, collaborate a lot more uh, in the last couple of years. Um, we've all been familiar with the no PO, uh, no pay, but that's gone. It's no PO, no buy, right? So stringent adherence to uh, a documentation before a purchase or P cards, we're seeing a lot of that happening, uh, you know, on the procurement side of things. The second big area that we have uh, seen a focus on is the entire concept of master data, right? Um, not only are more controls being enforced when suppliers are being set up, we're also seeing a big adoption in, in terms of, you know, data cleansing, you know, the entire concept of data governance today, of keeping data clean. And that downstream impact of some of these is making accounts payable a much better process today than it was, right? So that's a little bit on the procurement process. Uh, the other couple of trends, uh, one again, analytics and insights. Uh, three years back, uh, Sid would agree, uh, you know, accounts payable was all about spend analytics, right? I mean, uh, we, we spoke about spend analytics, tail spend. That was the flavor of the season. It still continues to be a big, big driver in analytics, right? But today, um, a lot of us, right, uh, look to analytics to do a lot more, right? Uh, everything from identifying early payment discounts, uh, looking for discrepancies, identifying outliers, you, you know, every one of those processes require an analytical insights and uh, we use the entire concept of a knowledge graph to really be able to pinpoint and get a lot of data mined. So that's, you know, and we use techniques such as uh, knowledge graphs, and we also use, uh, you know, technologies such as Solanus to be able to do this, right? Um, the, the penultimate uh, area that I wanted to focus on was controls. Um, gone are the days of, you know, reactive controls and duplicates being the only thing that, you know, the accounts payable function looks at, right? Um, uh, Sid was asking us a question before this on how we looked at duplicate invoices. And, and the way we perhaps looking at it is, um, you see, duplicates are just one element of, of the entire focus on controls. We as an organization have completely revamped our strategy. We're looking at what we describe as proactive controls, right? Um, what proactive controls means is that you don't really wait for an audit to, to figure out what's going wrong, right? You are mining data on a day-to-day -day basis. Every end of day, there is a you know, machine learning model that is running on data sets, uh, looking at potential outliers, frauds, transactions that are posted uh, you know, on, a, on a day that it should not have been posted, you know, transactions after office hours, transaction weekends. So there are a myriad of variables that are being checked today that is actually uh, reducing the, the incidence of fraud on, on, on a lot of AP processes, right? So the entire focus on proactive controls over reactive controls. And finally, um, I also want to talk about some of the strategic initiatives that are happening in the market, not specifically AP-related, but enterprise-related uh, you know, uh, trends that we're seeing. Um, there is a big focus on uh, consortium-driven buying, uh, especially in certain geos. And while the big benefits accrue in terms of better cash flow and you know better better uh, the cost price and the likes of it, there is also downstream impact in reducing the number of invoices that are coming through, and that's making AP processes better. Um, again, cash is king. The last two years, everybody has been talking about conservation in, in in a really big way, cash conservation in a big way. Uh, we have seen a lot of platforms offer very innovative models. Supply chain financing is not new, but a lot of innovative models in the marketplace that you know are making. Uh, the, the, the DPO uh, much better for a lot of companies, right? And, and finally, the last thing I would want to leave you with is, um, you know, we're also seeing conversations around accounts payable as a service where people are telling uh, service providers like us to bring in our technology, to bring in our services, and to manage the entire spend, right? We get, uh, you know, it's an outcome-based model where we manage spend effectively and we get a percentage of that in terms of uh, in terms of our attention fees. So broadly, uh, some of the levers that I wanted to talk to you about before I hand this over to Hari, who's got some really exciting stuff. Uh, any questions uh, that I can take? Uh, I, I'm. Uh, thank you very much, Sandy. There, there's a there's a, a myriad of questions uh, that have come through, and I, I'd like to ask you one or two, if I may. 
before we we do the handover. You spoke about ERS. Are you seeing this as a key lever for a transformation? It's a great question. Um, the answer is yes. Um, you know, I mean, it did. It, it always existed in certain industries. Uh, but yeah. we're seeing a lot of conversations that are now occurring because of, you know, people asking us, should we really do ERS, right? We we do tell them that ERS is not a simple uh, flick of a button. It's a slightly involved process. It's a strategic program, right? Um, so we are seeing, you know, um, just to give you examples, of course, you have to, le have, to have legality of jurisdiction. Uh, it's not legal in all jurisdictions. So legality of jurisdiction is something that we're really looking for. Uh, we also don't want to do this without technology, right? So we right. definitely tell them that it needs to be ERP driven to be really able to get the benefits. So you don't do self billing without the relevant technology. Uh, absolutely, we're seeing a lot of interest around that in certain industries. Retail is a big, big adopter of of of, uh, of self billing. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because there's another question that's come through, that's sort of related to that to a degree. Can you provide insight into of automated vendor onboarding as part of this? process how do you get the vendors on how do you normalize the vendors and ensure that they actually can meet uh, the stringent requirements of the of the buying organization no no great question um ers especially is slightly more involved because you really need to get into a partnership a contracting agreement with each one of your vendors it's a little involved and you try to do that with your mm. larger vendors right when you have a big purchase coming in but on the supplier onboarding component itself um uh, we've seen a variety of incentives that companies are giving, right, to adopt um, a supplier onboarding and whatever, right, uh, whatever kind of supplier onboarding, right. We also, uh, you know, it's a carrot and stick approach, and the stick is also working. Uh, for example, on help this, uh, we are seeing that people are switching off certain um, uh, features. Like, for example, you don't respond to certain query types if you are not onboarded on a on a, on a self service right. platform. So there's a there's a there's a there's a carrot and stick approach that people are taking, but uh, it's getting a lot more uh, intense in that sense. And we're offering services like a concierge service for suppliers uh, to, to make the entire adoption uh, more velvet glove, right? So that's broadly how we're addressing supplier onboarding. Yeah, thank you. That makes that makes absolute sense because that that's quite a uh, can be a little bit of a bumpy road for for a lot of folks. But uh, um, and there's another another quick question that's just come through. And, and sorry to, because I think the flow has been brilliant. And and uh, Harry, please please forgive me for asking this question at this particular juncture. Um, what are the key metrics uh, that you measure for improved AP performance? We have actually tried to move away from the tactical, um, you know, uh, tact-driven metrics. Uh, mm -hmm. We are trying to engage with customers on, on the larger business metrics, right? I mean, uh, if we engage with them on a DPO kind of a metric, uh, that really adds a lot of value to both of us. Uh, so wherever sure, possible, yes. um, you know, we are looking at throughput as a lever, um, you know, to see what is the actual uh, touchless throughput that is going in. We're looking at DPO as a metric, and wherever mm -hmm. we can engage in a partnership basis, those are the kind of metrics that we're really involved in. Uh, turnaround time, you know, very tactical. It still exists in certain pockets, but that's not our focus area. It is more on the business metrics that our focus is on. Yeah, uh, it makes that absolute sense. And uh, so, please, uh, that's that, I've got, still got a few more questions, but I'll hold off and, be, and yeah. because uh, I want to continue with the goodness. I want to invite Hari to perhaps give us all the goodness on the digital side. Uh, thanks, uh, Sandeep and Sid, and uh, certainly very interesting conversations. Now, as the world is going digital, and we've seen a lot of that uh, in the pandemic uh, time, AP is no exception. And so we've seen six digital trends, uh, if you will. Uh, and I'll start with the first, uh, which is platforms. And while platforms is not a new thing in the AP space, uh, earlier, these were predominantly used for workflow management and AP is a very transactional process. And now what we are seeing is two very distinct trends. Uh, number one is customers are take, adopting a more holistic approach. They are moving upstream, looking at the procure to pay process. And the fundamental premise being that the more upstream you digitize, and in fact, I will use the word digitalize, uh, which is around, uh, you know, adopting through true electronic uh, channels and electronic processing, the lesser your downstream problems are. So that's one, and here is where uh, you'll, we are seeing a lot of uptick in platforms such as Coupa and Ariba, 
where customers are taking an end-to-end -end holistic view. That's number one. Second, uh, you know, we still have a quite a large install base of Oracle and SAP, and while they are great systems from a control and compliance standpoint, uh, what we've seen is uh, customers, especially in today's day and age, uh, the system of engagement is something that they're looking for, and that's where we've seen a lot of players, uh, you know, Vim, which is very popular in the SAP world, uh, Infosys, uh, we at Infosys have uh, what we uh, call it as an AP on cloud, uh, which is uh, the platform. And these are over the top platforms. These are platforms that in most cases sit on top of an Oracle or an SAP, but provide the system of engagement, automation, cognitive uh, capabilities and things like that. So that's one big trend that we're seeing. Second, uh, and we spoke about it, uh, again, a lot of shift to digital channels, whether it is portals, uh, whether it is chatbots and things like that, again, the pandemic has accelerated this and we've seen that, you know, when you're forced to do it, you do it. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of uptake in terms of adoption of these kind of channels. And it's not really surprising to me, uh, you know, by some estimates, there is a 10 is to 1 ROI when we adopt these channels. Uh, you know, leave aside the experience that we see uh, with these channels. Third, and Sandeep briefly mentioned, and while the larger game plan uh, in AP digitization is around e-invoicing and things like that, uh, but as a first step, a lot of customers are moving to digital invoices as in PDF and things like that. And we're clearly seeing investments from uh, providers as well. And, uh, you know, gone are the days where we were seeing really bad accuracy and with the advent of technologies such as AI ML, uh, in document extraction, a lot of providers, uh, including us, looking at fuzzy match and saying that document extraction is a means to an end. Uh, and therefore, can we enrich the document that's being extracted? Can we look at uh, AI and those kind of technologies? So that's the third trend that we are seeing in terms of a digital shift. Fourth is an interesting one, uh, which is around very, very interesting use cases of AI and machine learning coming in, be it uh, things like, and, and while uh, Sandeep did mention no PO, no pay, we still see a, see a quite a lot of non-PO invoice processing and being able to predict the GL code using AI ML, uh, being able to proactively predict what could go wrong uh, in terms of the invoices getting blocked. Uh, Sandeep spoke about knowledge graph and I, I'll, I'll cover that in a bit, but uh, a lot of these kind of uh, use cases that AI and ML can bring to bear. Uh, the fifth, uh, a very interesting one, uh, networks are back, but I'll take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, it's always been a problem with adoption. That said, uh, with the pandemic and pressures uh, on cost to serve, we are again seeing a resurgence of networks, but it's this time around we're seeing a slightly different shift uh, with the upstream moment, which I spoke about in the platformization that we are seeing uh, with the Kupas and the Aribas and a lot of them also bringing in networks of their own. And they do have the benefit of having the, the entities or the objects such as a purchase order and those kind of things. It, it makes it that much more easier. And, uh, you know, by some estimate, again, 60-70% uh, ROI is, uh, in terms of cost reduction is what we have seen with uh, electronic invoicing, different forms and shapes, but nevertheless, that's a trend that we're seeing. And last but not the least, early days uh, on blockchain, but we are seeing a significant interest. In our view, this is an inevitable shift that's going to happen. It's going to take some time, but blockchain's uh, core capabilities around immutability, multi-party access, security, uh, are things that lend itself extremely well. If there's one domain that uh, can be easily blockchain, it's AP. And so we are seeing a lot of interest, uh, you know, for example, Ariba investing in a blockchain capability, OB10. We've, we've seen quite a lot of uh, lot of startups as well there. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of interest. So in summary, these are the six trends that we are seeing um, from a digitization and a digital standpoint in terms of AP. Uh, I'll take a quick pause here to see if there are any questions for me. Otherwise, I, I want to pick pick it up from here in terms of how we've really brought this to life with one of our customers. Well, Harry, um, there's been a, a number of questions come through. One, one of the, one of the uh, questions that's come through, what are the key metrics measured for AP performance? 
that's a critical part of the forest for a lot of folks when they're trying to justify and report against their investments. Sure. I think, some, as Sandeep mentioned, uh, uh, I'm assuming you're talking of AP performance, uh, Sid. Uh, so as Sandeep yes. mentioned, uh, see, there are a bunch of things. One is, uh, again, a lot of people are moving out of input metrics to output metrics. So, Outcome. Absolutely. So outcomes. So for example, touchless, what percentage of touchless AP are you doing? And a lot of it manifests in your cost to serve. So what's your cost per invoice looking like? That's one. Mm. Second, uh, especially in supply, and then there are business metrics. And again, uh, our view here has been uh, that it's not a one size fits all. For example, if you're in a very supply chain intensive industry, you are your uh, on-time payment becomes a very critical component. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's an example. Your DPO and 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 therefore the impact of AP on working capital optimization. That's the third one that we've seen a lot of uh, adoption. And of course the the touchlessness itself is measured in different ways. For example, what is what percentage of invoicing are you seeing, and and mm -hmm. is that trend going positive, uh, you know, quarter on quarter, uh, year on year, and things like that. So these are some of the metri metrics that we've seen uh, customers look at uh, in terms of, and all of this is, if you notice, uh, pretty outcome focused. Indeed, uh, absolutely. You know, because we're seeing, we're having a lot of questions coming through about, you know, uh, improving DPO and optimizing cash and everything else like that. So that early visibility of of commitments is so critical in terms of Treasury time to trying to measure uh, measure its DPO uh, requirements and uh, cash optimization and cash cash pooling requirements. So, uh, are you seeing a, a trend towards mo trend towards early settlement discounts because you're optimizing the process much earlier in the train? Or are you looking at DPO extension? Yeah, in fact, uh, it's interesting. And uh, uh, what we are seeing, especially in the, in the pandemic world, cash is king. Uh, and so yes. what we've seen is we have not honestly seen a lot of early settlement happening. Uh, right. uh, uh, on the other hand, we are seeing DPO management uh, and then it's interesting and it actually uh, defeats conventional wisdom. But, you know, a lot of customers, what we have seen is they really don't have good visibility and often times uh, they end up paying suppliers early. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is, of course, a cash drain. Uh, and you need to have the right balance of not really and many, many, especially in a very tight supply chain, we also see the other side of it as well in terms of penalties when you don't pay suppliers on time. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, introducing risk in your supply chain and so on. And of course, in the US, we've all seen that. Uh, how many times have we gone to uh, grocery chains to see things not being there and so on? Uh, mm -hmm. So therefore, the right balance in terms of making sure that you manage your DPO, which means that you you don't pay on, um, you know, you don't pay early, but at the same time, you manage your risks is what we are seeing as a trend. In fact, one of the things that we are seeing is Transactional processing is kind of something that uh, is passive. People are doing it. People will find ways of doing it. The larger game, and I'm going to introduce a word which I will I will build on in a little bit, is on sentience. It, it, it is about how am I able to be a sense, analyze, and respond organization uh, in terms mm -hmm. of DP? What can I do with data? And I need to balance. Uh, you know, I would have, and it's not one size fit all. I'll have categories that I procure and and buy which are sensitive and I need to be careful about how I manage my spend there. And then there are other categories where I can go back and negotiate better terms, a better DPO. And, and actually the CFOs and the APO organization is looking for systems to give, provide guidance on how are things looking. And Sandeep mentioned analytics. So leveraging analytics to be able to drive these kind of strategies in cash management is also something that we are seeing a lot of customers ask us for. Uh, absolutely. I can see the key trends in terms of uh, you know, accounts pay being a key pillar of the treasury and uh, cash optimization strategy because early visibility gives you much more opportunity to manage cash more more intelligently. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll hold the questions back from now and please, please continue. Sure. So here's an example. It's, it's a very interesting example. Uh, and I think a lot of things that came out in the poll are, are manifesting here. Uh, so the, here's a customer, it is a large conglomerate and they process and pay thousands of invoices every month. 
uh, and they were it was a classic conundrum uh, they had seven different uh, systems erp systems that they were uh, using you know through a legacy which came by through a legacy uh, evolution highly manual uh, invoice management and i'm talking of right from invoice receiving an entry to payment and a very high cost to serve and so here's where we brought in uh, our epoch platform ap on cloud platform and uh, a lot of digital interventions at that uh, for example uh, one of the big challenges that they were trying to grapple with is you know when an invoice is not paid and you get a supplier calling you you really don't know which system was it or which of the seven systems it was being processed in where are the bottlenecks and why is it happening and so that's where we brought in this layer of sentience of course the upfront digitization in terms of um, they were not quite ready uh, at this stage to look at e invoicing so we brought in um, you know the iocr ai ml based iocr capabilities uh, to be able to get the digitization going uh, followed it up with a layer of analytics to be able to exactly pinpoint where is the bottleneck what erp system do you need to fix it in why is it happening um, and a lot of digital shift uh, especially in areas such as adoption of chatbot uh, in fact proactive supplier communication was something else that we did before the supplier calls us can we get across to the supplier in terms of what the problem is and things like that uh, and all of this ultimately uh, we were able to and uh, said going back to your question on outcomes uh, and so here's some examples of things that we measured we measured uh you know their cost to serve we were able to uh, in a very quick uh time get their cost to serve improved by over 50% uh again uh, it's in uh, it's uh, parts of their business that uh, uh, intensive in terms of how they manage the supplier relationship so being uh, on the dot on on time payments uh, digitization uh, fallouts and those were the kind of things that we measured and of course uh, you know cash is king so the dpo and how do they manage working capital of course this is half the story but a very critical part at that so these were the kind of things that we did uh, with uh, with this and again you can see that a lot of trends that sandeep spoke about and uh, the digital ones that i spoke about uh, are manifesting uh, in this case example uh, that uh, i'm speaking about uh, which is a good segue into uh, framework that we have created we call it ap.live uh, and uh, the live the intent behind live is about making our customers ap operations a live enterprise and just like living organisms who can very quickly adapt uh, the idea is to bring in an ability to sense analyze and respond uh in the ap value chain so that's the whole philosophy behind ap.life and our epoch platform is built on this um and uh, uh you know while there are five different facets in the interest of time i'll talk about three critical things that we bring to bear uh in this thought process and the first is of course uh, networked and connected and that's where if you look at it uh the big problem to solve is in upfront uh and again uh, one of the things that we have seen uh in terms of e invoicing adoption is the fragmentation of the e invoicing space you know supplies always a challenge with this and so that's where what we have done is we have pre integrated ourselves with multiple different e invoicing networks so we take that pain out for suppliers uh and and our customers also uh so that's one part of it the second part of it is around hyper automation and for the 30 depending on whatever wherever you are in your journey the 30 40% of the happy path uh, is is fine and it's great but for the 50 60% that falls out what we've done is we have and we know different customers will be at different journeys so we've created a myriad of solutions right from iocr for um, digital adoption of uh, invoices and ingestion of invoices to ai ml in terms of uh, all of the use cases around predictive uh, uh predict, predicting uh gl codes for non po being able to proactively predict what could really go wrong uh, and that's where we use things like knowledge graph uh, to be able to identify the blind spots that could come in uh to uh you know 
insights, uh, as you mentioned, that to insights in terms of how how's your working capital looking like? How's your on-time payment looking like? Uh, and what are the things that could go wrong and things like that? And uh, and again, some very critical metrics that uh, we are uh, we delivering and look to deliver through this whole uh, framework is around looking at getting as touchless as possible. Uh, you know, target 70, 80% touchless processing speed is important um, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, can we process in under a day? Can we look at DPO and working capital optimization? And uh, those those are the kind of things uh, that we are delivering through AP.Live. Again, uh, to summarize, it is the intent is to make the AP operation a live sentient enterprise. Sentience is a very large part of this story in terms of being able to both react and adapt very quickly. And the pandemic uh, showed us that this is very critical. And the second part of sentience is how can we use data and analytics to be able to drive uh, better outcomes? Uh, and, and, and of course, at the same time, ensuring that you're ad adhering to compliance requirements and all the other aspects of, of good governance. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, of course, adhering to compliance and compliance is, is, is the holy grail. So none of this, it's about making sure, make you know, having anything to do with relaxing controls. We have to adhere to controls. In fact, uh, there is a, um, there is a, a thought process around how can we automate these compliances? Can we, if there are duplicate payments that are happening, right? If if there are controls that are going uh, out of whack, the ability for uh, the system to be able to flag this off because that's a critical thing that needs to be done in this. So that's, of course, uh, given that controls and compliances are very critical in terms of the overall uh, story and the solution. Uh, which actually is a good segue into uh, something that uh, I want to talk about, which is around knowledge graph. Again, this is uh, extending the sentience and how we deliver. And really, the philosophy behind knowledge graph is, can we look at the business data points and be able to connect the business data points into cognitive action. Uh, and that's the key part here. So while you know you have the 30, 40% of the happy path, the larger uh, uh, game plan is how do you handle the 50, 60%? So let me take some examples of how the knowledge graph is being used. Uh, for example, you could have a situation which uh, you know we are showing here where uh, you know there's an invoice that has come in and the supplier potentially could have invoiced uh, the customer earlier than they should. And, 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 and we see a lot of this happen. So, and the knowledge graph in this case is able to tell that, hey, don't expend effort trying to see why is this not going through and you'd better wait. Versus uh, you could have situations that is very, very prevalent in material intensive commodity kind of industries. And we see a lot of supply chains uh, have this where uh, whether the quantity and the price are often times are determined at the time of shipment. And so when you get the invoice, you are invariably going to get into an unhappy path. And so, uh, you know, depending on what kind of controls uh, that you want to implement, uh, either it could be an automated nudge in terms of saying, hey, you need to do a PO amendment. And in fact, even trigger automatically the PO amendment, depending on your controls and compliance um, or it could be a human nudge uh, given to a human uh, to make those changes um, so that you know ultimately the payment happens um, and you expend as little effort in the knowledge graph does a lot of analysis and analytics for you. And this is just one example. Uh, the other example is if you are looking at analytics and looking at your working capital optimization, DPO management and things like that, how do you use all of these analytics, uh, including uh, simulators that we bring in, Treasury, uh, and Sid, you mentioned that Treasury could have some targets of how to manage working capital, especially in these days. So how do you play with a lot of these kind of things, these vectors, to be able to then come up with a strategy that you can then, of course, implement this going beyond the brief of transactional AP, but nevertheless, it is AP management. Uh, so that, in summary, uh, is our approach. And to, to summarize, we spoke about the digital and the industry trends and our ap.live philosophy including knowledge graph and what we have done is to bring all of this to bear 
uh, into an overall solution. And of course, we offer uh, different models. Uh, our preferred model is a BIPAS or an outcome-based managed services model. Uh, so that, you know, what we want to ensure as a service provider is our customers get outcomes and it's not technology or transformation for the sake of transformation. That was a fascinating insight into uh, the capabilities. I think Knowledge Graph had such a, a, a multi-dimensional view over the art of the possible and and and, and from a from a pure treasury perspective it gives a, ma a maximum insight into how to how to manage cash you know because you know somebody's receivable is another person's payable so you, when you look at that balance piece that makes makes it makes a huge amount of sense and uh, i think that uh, our delegates will get a, a great great deal of value out of understanding the depth of what the knowledge graph can deliver in terms of outcomes and goodness so thank thank you very much for that and and sandeep do you, have you anything to add uh, no, I hope, uh, you know, we've taken a little bit of uh, time in addition to what we've been allocated, but uh, we just wanted to say thank you so much. I think it's been a privilege to be on the panel. Um, so thank you for having us on this panel. Oh, you did a great job. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I think your insights were magnificent. And I'm sure our, our delegates will continue to ask questions and they'll flow through to you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the time and we really enjoyed it. Yeah, you're very welcome. And I just want to encourage folks to connect with Harry and Sandeep. I, I put their information on the console as well as some additional insights um, in the resource center. So we can continue the conversation.